Chapter Fourteen of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Fourteen: Two Conspirators. Doris, knowing that she could trust Bob, made him promise eternal secrecy, and then she told him the whole story, withholding only the name of the highwayman. The lad was indeed surprised at this sudden turn of affairs, and he said at once, "'You don't need to tell me who it is, Doris. I know it was Tom Duffy, who was expelled from High last week, and he said he was going to skip town.' Doris wondered if she ought to deny this, but desiring to shield Danny, she said nothing at the time. Bringing forth a bag of gold, she gave it to the boy. He concealed it in the deep pocket of his heavy overcoat. Then he said, "'Now, Doris, you just leave it to me.' i'll find some way to return this to the old man to-night so that he may be relieved of his worrying i'll wait for a hunch then as the work of tidying the kitchen was finished bob exclaimed now bundle up doris i'll draw you on the sled while i skate we can't let you miss all of the fun they were greeted with jolly shouts when they appeared and dick jensen slid up to them stopping only to do a double figure of eight in which accomplishment he excelled then taking the rope of the sled from bob's warmly gloved hand he said I'll be Doris's pony. I'm sure she would rather have me, and, if I'm not mistaken, you'll find Rose waiting for you beyond the point. Bob's face lighted. It was understood among these young people that some day, when they were older, Rose and Bob would be engaged, and since it was the only real romance in their midst, they all took a delighted interest in it. For an hour the gleaming ice was the picture of a merry wild winter frolic, but as soon as the sun began rapidly to descend to the horizon, Bob took Rose's horn and blew thereon a long, clear blast, while the maiden at his side, with cheeks as glowing as her ruddy name, Flower, beckoned the skaters shorewards. "'Time to be going,' Bob called as they flocked in. "'The sky is so cloudy the moon won't be able to light us home, so we'll try to make it before dark.' Half an hour later the cabin had been securely locked and the sleigh filled with merrymakers, and the horses eager to be away after their long rest in the shelter of a shed. It was nearly dark when the inn was reached. Mr. Wiggin appeared in the door to exclaim, "'Well, I'm mighty glad to see you young folks headed for town. My wife's been worrying the whole afternoon, knowing that highwayman was still at large.' The sheriff and his men found some tracks just back of the inn leading toward the pine wood. Mary put in excitedly, "'Oh, Mr. Wiggin, if that robber was riding a horse, we know where he turned towards the old Dorchester Road, but the innkeeper shook his head. No, he was afoot.' The old man Bartlett said, Hal Spinney from the milk farm went by a spell earlier on horseback. How is Mr. Bartlett now? Gertrude asked solicitously. Well, he's pretty much all in, Mr. Wiggin replied sympathetically. Then, jerking his thumb over his shoulder, he said in a low voice, as though not wishing to be heard, My wife wouldn't hear to his going back to his shack up in the woods, so she's got him here in by the fire. He's pretty hard hit, as you can guess, that five hundred dollars being his entire lifetime savings. Bob was thinking hard. Now was the time to give the money back to old man Bartlett. But he had promised Doris he would not tell how she procured it. He thought it queer that the girl should care to protect the ne'er-do-well of a Tom Duffy. Nevertheless, he had given his word and would keep it. Jack was driving and was about to start the horses when Bob called. Wait a minute, Jack, will you? I'd like to take a look at those tracks. Mr. Wiggin, I'm a shark at recognizing shoe prints. I wish you'd show them to me. The girls who were not in the secret smiled at each other knowingly. This carried out their theory that the members of the CDC were trying to solve the mystery of the highwayman. "'Sure thing, I'll show them to you,' the garrulous innkeeper replied. "'Wait till I get a lantern. Dark settling down fast.' A couple of the other boys climbed out of the sleigh, idly curious, and accompanied Bob and Mr. Wiggin, who had appeared with a lighted lantern. Doris clenched her hands together nervously under the buffalo rope. That Bob had his hunch, she was sure, but what he was about to do, she could not guess. Five minutes passed, and ten, then the boys returned, greatly excited. They were all talking at once. What happened? Mary called out. Happened? Dick Jensen exclaimed. The money's been found. Mr. Wiggin stumbled right over that bag of gold. The robber must have been frightened and dropped it in the snow close to his tracks. Every cent of it was there. Oh, thank goodness! Gertrude exclaimed. Now the old man can stop worrying. Mr. Wiggin held the lantern up, his round face glowing. It sure was a lucky thing that Bob here wanted to look at those tracks, he said. 
No telling but what that robber might have come back in the night, knowing where he had dropped it. "'Do hurry in, Mr. Wiggin, and give it to old Mr. Bartlett,' Doris begged, and if there was an unusual tenderness in her voice, none of the others noticed it. Bob glanced meaningly in her direction as he sat beside his rose, and Doris, who had been silent before that, suddenly became the life of the party. "'Oh, boys, please change your minds about taking us right home,' she pleaded. "'We girls want to turn up the wood road just a little distance.' "'Why, Doris Drexel,' Betty Bird cried in evident alarm. "'What a wild suggestion! Why in the world would we want to go up their very road where the robbery took place?' "'That's what I'd like to know,' Bertha began. Then she remembered that Doris's suggestion was merely the carrying out of their plan to try to discover if the boys of the CDC held their secret meetings in the old Wesley haunted house. If the boys were willing to take the girls through the old ruin, it would mean it was not their meeting place. "'Oh, yes, do let's go,' Bertha then seconded. "'All right,' Jack sang out willingly. "'I'll have to back up a little. We've passed the wood road.' "'Oh, girls,' Mary gave Doris and Bertha a wink of understanding. "'Let's go there some other time. I think we've given our guest of honour enough thrills for tonight.' To which Geraldine heartily agreed, and so the horses were turned out onto the highway. When the girls had been left at their homes, the boys laughed and shouted as though a good joke. The girls would indeed have been mystified if they had heard them. End of chapter 14